The second season of Star Trek almost didn't have Spock. Leonard Nimoy noticed that he was getting a lot more fan mail than the rest of the cast and he was like, you know what, I think I deserve a raise. They didn't want to give it to him so they began preparations to let him go and cast an entirely new Vulcan. Mark Cushman says the fan mail got so intense during the first year, sacks and sacks of mail every day. His agent said he's only getting $1,250 a week and he needs a raise. But Desilu is losing money on the show and the board of directors is thinking of cancelling it even if NBC wanted to continue because it was bankrupting the studio. So they said we can't give you a raise and they replied he's not reporting to work. Gene Kuhn returns from vacation on April 1st and has a memo from Gene Roddenberry that says, Dear Gene, this is not an April Fool's joke. It looks like we'll be going forward without Mr. Spock. We've hired another actor and he'll be playing a different Vulcan character on the show. It really came down to the wire and the one that broke the stalemate was the one that didn't want Spock in the first place. NBC. You are not doing the show without that guy. Pay him whatever you need to pay him to keep him on the show. When Leonard Nimoy wanted something, he would be candid about demanding it. Shatner, however, was a lot more sneaky. James Dewan said, Bill has a big, fat head. Bill thinks of Bill, whereas Leonard thinks of the show first and thinks of himself second. Bill doesn't like anyone to do good acting around him. I can remember Dee complaining about that when we were doing the series. The scripts would come in with Dee having major parts and somebody talked them out of it. And there I was, favored during the second year, that were all cut out. I end up with six lines. This season features the first appearance of Chekhov. Here's Roddenberry's explanation of why he had added Chekhov to the cast. Chekhov came on the show because I'd read something and uh, someone had sent me a copy of a Russian newspaper in which they said after our first year, oh, the ugly Americans are at it again. We were the first people in space, and then, but the Americans don't even have a Russian aboard this crew. So I wrote the Russian aboard the crew and wrote a, sent a copy of it to the communist youth newspaper, which they never answered. That's all bullshit. They really added Chekhov because they thought they'd widen their audience by putting a young guy who looks like Davy Jones on the bridge. Walter Koenig says they were looking for somebody who would appeal to the bubblegum set. They had somebody in mind like Davy Jones of the Monkees. All that stuff about Pravda, you know, the complaining, that's all nonsense. That was all just publicity. Walter Koenig was cute back then, but he was also balding. So they put a goofy looking wig on him until his hair grew out enough that he could comb it over. In the first episode of this season, Spock is going crazy because every seven years, Vulcans need to mate or they die. The Enterprise takes him to Vulcan so he can marry the woman to whom he is betrothed, but she claims to prefer Kirk, so they have to battle to the death. This is the episode in which the Vulcan salute is used for the first time. This is the episode in which the Enterprise is grabbed by a giant green hand, which is referenced in Star Trek Beyond. They encounter a planet inhabited by some guy claiming to be the Greek god Apollo. Scotty is incredulous, and according to Kirk, he doesn't believe in gods. The Enterprise encounters a space probe from Earth that has gone crazy and is now wiping out all life on planet after planet. The probe would float around on fishing line and everything it did looked hilarious. It erases Uhura's brain and kills Scotty, then brings Scotty back to life. They have to re-educate Uhura from scratch, which they manage to complete by the next episode somehow. The probe also alters the Enterprise's engines so it can reach Warp 11, which is impressive since Warp 10 supposedly wasn't achievable until they did it in that episode of Voyager in which Janeway and Paris turn into lizards. But maybe they used a different scale in the original series. Everyone knows this episode. Crew members from an evil alternate universe get switched with crew members from this universe because of a weird transporter accident. The mirror universe uniforms always look way more badass. Advancing in rank in this universe is commonly done by assassinating your superiors. Chekhov tries to kill Kirk, so they put him in this weird pain tube. Evil Spock doesn't really seem all that evil, though. Spock doesn't want to assassinate Kirk and become captain himself because then somebody would try to kill him and he'd rather just stick to doing sciencey stuff. Kirk, as usual, gives exposition via the captain's log, but I kept wondering what the point was of making log entries that would just be left in the alternate universe. This is another episode that has evil flowers like this side of paradise. This is the second episode in which the crew gets messed up by some magic alien flowers. If you're a red shirt, don't go on away missions, and if you do, don't go anywhere near any weird looking flowers. Also, if you're Spock, don't go near them. Spock gets stoned on alien flowers every time. The inhabitants of this planet look oddly familiar. I feel we've seen one of these hideous orange skinned, white eyelidded, blonde bouffanted creatures before. Apparently they don't reproduce, so they get very confused when they see Chekhov making out with his girlfriend. Then the aliens start making out and the weird snakehead-shaped computer that runs the planet gets mad. 
The Enterprise comes across a star system in which every planet has been destroyed. They find the remains of another starship, the Constellation. On board, they find the captain, Commodore Matt Decker. He tells them about the giant robot doomsday machine that eats planets. When he gets onto the Enterprise, he relieves Spock of command while Kirk is still on the Constellation in order to pursue the doomsday machine. Kirk demands that Spock take back command, and Decker goes crazy and steals a shuttlecraft so he can fly it into the space monster. Neither Uhura nor Chekhov are in this episode, despite the fact that there was clearly a role written for Uhura. Her place was taken by some blonde lady named Lieutenant Palmer. Lieutenant Kyle beams up a dead guy, and a voice coming from somewhere tells Kirk that the ship is cursed. Kirk, Spock, and Bones beam down to the nearest planet and see a bunch of weird ghosts and shit. Then they find a spooky castle where Scotty and Sulu show up, but are apparently under some kind of mind control. Turns out the planet is run by this guy named Korob, who has been trying to scare them off, then tries to bribe them to go away. But they want to find out why the crew member they beamed up was killed. Korob's lady friend Sylvia has this voodoo doll of the Enterprise that she holds over a candle, causing the Enterprise crew to feel the heat. Then they put a force field around the ship and refuse to let it go until Kirk obeys Kolob and they turn Bones into a zombie like Scotty and Sulu. Spock figures out that the spooky images were gathered from the crew's unconscious minds, but that they're incomplete. Sylvia wants to learn more about humanity from Kirk, but ends up getting all horny for him, so of course he has to make out with her while Kolob watches creepily. Once Sylvia realizes Kirk is just playing her, she turns into a giant cat and tries to kill him. Kirk finds the magic wand that gives Sylvia and Kolob their power and they turn into weird little bird-looking things. This is the episode in which Chekhov wears the goofiest looking wig. It was also the first episode filmed with Walter Koenig. A robot takes over the Enterprise and takes it to a planet full of robots, apparently run by Harry Mudd. However, while the robots serve Harry Mudd, they won't let him leave the planet. Turns out the robots were built by humanoids from Andromeda. Kirk worries that the ability and willingness of the robots to serve the crew of the Enterprise undermines their will to escape. Chekhov, for example, said that his planet was better than Leningrad. Apparently sometime in the future, St. Petersburg's name changes back to Leningrad. They discover that these robots can be destroyed by illogical statements and bad interpretive dance. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are on a shuttlecraft and attacked by a cloud of hydrogen. They end up on a planet and run into Zephram Cochran, the inventor of warp drive. He looks familiar to Kirk, but not much like James Cromwell. He said that the cloud of gas, whom he calls the Companion, found him when he was an old man, rejuvenated him, and kept him alive on this planet where Kirk found him. He was thought to have died 150 years prior, which, assuming that date isn't rounded off, would have been the year 2117. He says he was 87 at the time he disappeared, so if we assume that the date of his disappearance is the same as the date of his presumed death, he was born in the year 2030. That means that when the events of first contact occurred in 2063, he would have been 32 or 33. He did not age well. Maybe he looks like this because of all of the radiation damage that would have been done to his face by his exposure to all the radioactive elements he used to power his ship. This is the episode that introduced the Andorians and the Tellarites. They didn't feature prominently again until Enterprise. It's also the first episode in which Spock's mother Amanda appears. The Enterprise takes some Federation ambassadors to the planet Babel to discuss the admittance of a new planet into the Federation. Spock's father Sarek is accused of murdering a Tellarite ambassador. Dr. McCoy briefs the crew on a violent species of people who like to wear angora and ponytails inhabiting a planet that the Federation wants to mine. A Klingon shows up on the planet and a red shirt pulls a phaser on him with predictable results. Everyone in this episode seems to pronounce Klingon differently. Some people say Klingon and some others say Klingon. Also McCoy accidentally makes a pregnant lady think that her baby is his. The crew ends up on a planet full of old people and then start aging really quickly. At first they thought the aging was the result of some weapon the Romulans were using since they were near the neutral zone. Kirk starts to get really senile and the rest of the crew wants to relieve him of command, but he gets indignant at the suggestion. It's interesting to compare the old age makeup that they used in this episode to what the actors actually ended up looking like. A few red shirts beam down to a planet and are drained of all of their red corpuscles, as Kirk puts it. They were killed by a giant smoke monster that attacked the Farragut when Kirk served on that ship, and he gets obsessively agitated by it. It chases the ship, but is discouraged after trying to feed on Spock's green blood. Scotty visits a space brothel and gets accused of space murder. Turns out there is a non-corporeal entity that once possessed Jack the Ripper, which made it into outer space and framed Scotty for murder. 
The Enterprise visits Sherman's planet, which is claimed by both Klingons and the Federation, but which, according to the terms of the peace treaty the Organians forced on them, is controlled by the Klingons. The deal was that whoever did the best job of developing the planet's infrastructure could control it, and the Klingons were in the lead. The Federation, however, has a high-yield grain that may allow their development efforts to catch up. Starfleet gives Kirk the job of guarding the grain held on Station K-7. Uhura buys a Tribble from a merchant on the station, and it turns out they love to eat grain. Kirk meets with the Klingon Commander Koloth, played by William Campbell, the same guy who played Trelane. Klingons hate Tribbles, and Tribbles hate Klingons, so the Tribbles scream annoyingly in the presence of Klingons. The Tribbles get into the grain compartment and eat most of it, then promptly die because the grain was poisoned. It was poisoned by a Klingon disguised as a human, who was discovered when Tribbles reacted badly to him. Although they may have been reacting to the fact that Kirk clearly had his thumbs stuck up those Tribbles' assholes. Kirk, Chekhov, and Uhura suddenly disappear and reappear on a planet that loves to play the fight music, with an alien lady that looks like Lady Gaga and an alien guy that looks like Anton LaVey. He explains that they were kidnapped to be trained to be gladiators for some reason. They have these things around their necks to zap them whenever Kirk tries to punch someone in the dick. The Enterprise finds a planet that modeled itself after 1920s Chicago, so everyone is a gangster. Somebody left a book called Chicago Mobs of the 20s on the planet a hundred years prior, upon which the inhabitants based their whole society. There's a big amoeba in space that eats planets and ships and is about to reproduce. Kirk explores a planet that he thought was primitive and peaceful, but now everyone has flintlock muskets and they're all fighting with one another. Also, there's this thing called the Mugato. Spock gets shot and the Klingons are sneaking around in orbit of the planet. They figure someone is breaking the Prime Directive and giving the people on this planet advanced technology. The Mugato bites Kirk, but he knows a guy on the planet who has an anti-venom. Kirk's buddy knows that Kirk is from another planet, but keeps it secret. His wife has the anti-venom, but won't give it to Kirk unless he tells her everything he knows about him. She claims that curing Kirk grants her ownership over him, so she asks for more weapons from Kirk. Kirk explains that one of the reasons for the Prime Directive is that the Federation wants to avoid causing a planet's weapons to advance faster than their wisdom. Turns out the Klingons have been giving them weapons, although they've been giving them progressively more advanced weapons instead of just giving them disruptors. Kirk figures, what the hell, Klingons are giving these people weapons, so fuck the Prime Directive. We need to give everyone flintlocks because we can't allow a flintlock gap. Hundreds of light years beyond where any Earth ship has ever explored, there's a planet inhabited by some guy named Sargon who demands that Kirk and his crew pay him a visit. The landing party includes Lieutenant Commander Molhall, played by Diana Moldar, who would later play Dr. Pulaski on The Next Generation. Sargon is a disembodied mind inside of a glass bulb whose voice was done by Jim Dewan. He claims that his species may be a distant ancestor of humans who traveled into space 6,000 centuries prior. Sargon takes over Kirk's body and wants other members of his species to take Spock's body and Mulhall's body. Sargon needs their bodies to build robot bodies, but taking control of a human body makes them all sweaty. Sargon wants the crew to volunteer for the procedure, and in return they will grant them advanced technology. Kirk convinces everyone to take the risk. Sargon and his wife Thalassa take over Kirk and Mulhall's bodies and immediately start feeling each other up. Their buddy Hanok takes over Spock's body and immediately starts acting like a sketch bag. The human bodies can't host Sargon and Thalassa without drugs that reduce their metabolisms. Hanok prepares a form formula that will kill Sargon and Kirk so he can keep Spock's awesome Vulcan body. He tries to convince Thalassa to keep the biological bodies because android bodies are kinda shitty. She then tries to convince Sargon, but then Kirk's body dies. Fortunately, Kirk's mind is still in Sargon's receptacle. Hanok finishes making Thalassa's shitty android body and she refuses to use it. Sargon manages to upload his mind into the Enterprise computers and repairs Kirk's body. Hanok destroys the receptacles, including the one holding Spock's consciousness, so Kirk and McCoy have to kill him. Sargon tricks everyone, including Henok, into thinking Spock's body died. Henok leaves Spock's body and his mind, which was held in Nurse Chapel's body, is returned. This is the one with the Nazi planet. Kirk and Spock disguise themselves as Nazis, but are discovered and whipped for it. The Fuhrer is Kirk's former history professor from the Academy. They escape from prison by fashioning a goofy-looking laser, and sneak into the Fuhrer's office by pretending to shoot a documentary. Turns out the Fuhrer is comatose, and the Nazis have just been propping him up like Weekend at Bernie's. McCoy revives him, and he explains that he modeled the planet after Nazi Germany because he saw it as the only way to unite the people of the planet. He thought he could create a Nazi planet that wasn't genocidal, but that didn't work out. 
Kirk finds this guy on a planet who's like, give me your ship. Turns out he and his lady friend are from Andromeda, and they steal the Enterprise and modify it for intergalactic travel. Spock attempts a Vulcan mind probe with one of the Andromedans, which I guess is similar to, but distinct from, a mind meld. As punishment, their leader turns a couple of red shirts into pumice stones. Spock and Scotty hatch a plan to destroy the ship so the Andromedans can't take it back to their own galaxy, and organize an invasion of the Milky Way. After Scotty gets one of them drunk, Kirk convinces them to release control of the Enterprise. Kirk and Spock beam aboard the USS Exeter and find a red shirt that has turned into bath salts. They go to the bridge and play a recording of the ship's medical officer telling them not to return to their own ship lest they turn everyone else into bath salts, and that the only cure is on Omega-4, the planet the Exeter is orbiting. The dominant culture on the planet seems quasi-Asian and is frequently attacked by white peoples they call the Yangs. Kirk interrupts an attempted execution of one of the Yangs and runs into Captain Tracy from the Exeter. They discover that he has been violating the Prime Directive by involving himself in the planet's conflicts. From here, the plot of the episode becomes similar to the plot of Star Trek Insurrection. Tracy explains that nobody on the planet seems to age, and that he intends to discover a way to exploit whatever it is that maintains their health. It turns out that the reason the people of the planet live so long is because they just evolved that way after millennia of war that nearly destroyed the culture of the Asian Omegans, and completely destroyed the culture of the White Omegans. The disease that turns you into bath salts was a biological weapon. By goofy coincidence, the White Omegans were also American and have a Bible with a picture of Spock in it. Richard Daystrom develops an artificially intelligent computer that can run the entire Enterprise. Kirk gets butthurt about the prospect of losing his job to a computer, but luckily for him it turned out to be evil. The Enterprise finds another planet whose history is coincidentally almost exactly like that of Earth. I guess the writers realized that an awful lot of episodes use this plot device. So Kirk says that all of these Earth-like planets develop according to Hodgkin's Law of Parallel Planetary Development. The significant difference between this planet and Earth is that this planet's Roman Empire lasted well into what would be the equivalent of 20th century development. Also, they find out that this planet has its own Jesus. Assignment Earth is what they call a backdoor pilot. If a network doesn't want to risk money on producing a pilot that they could end up throwing in the garbage if they don't like it, they'll let the people who proposed the show make a pilot they can still air as a TV movie or an episode of an already existing show if they decide not to turn it into a series. This episode was intended to set up a spin-off series that NBC ultimately rejected. For some reason, the Enterprise goes back in time to 1968 to do historical research on the time period, and they end up intercepting a transporter beam from a planet at 100 light years away. The guy they beam aboard calls himself Gary Seven and claims to be a 20th century human descended from humans taken from Earth thousands of years prior who were bred and trained for a mission to prevent Americans from launching nukes into space. Also, Terry Garr is in this episode as Gary Seven's sidekick. At the end of the episode, Kirk and Spock say they looked up Gary Seven in the historical record and tell him that he and Terry Garr end up having some very interesting experiences nudge nudge wink wink by this spin-off NBC. So that was the second season of Star Trek. I'm just finishing up my video for season three, so hopefully it won't be another ten months before that one comes out. See you on the next one.